I, I just want to thank everyone for I want to thank everyone for joining and especially Jean uh, Bonatel for uh, her willingness to speak with us today. Uh, Jean is the director of the Cornell Waste Management Institute and um, she's one of the foremost composting subject matter experts in North America. And um, apologize for the barking. Um, Jean, you want to um, go ahead and add anything you want to that introduction and tell us what you're going to speak about and then uh, take it away. Thank you. Okay, uh, audio's on. Let me get the. I've got to share my screen, right? So, share screen. Can we see it now? Uh, yes, we can see it. Okay. Go full screen and then we're good. Okay, and I can see Arlene in the corner. Uh, thanks everybody. And I appreciate the dog barking. That's a good welcome. I, I can go for that, so. Um, <clears throat> so today I was asked to talk a little bit about um, the brucellosis soy outbreak. Uh, that we experienced in New York State. Um, it was in August of this year of 2016 um, that we first had word that there was a problem. So just details of the outbreak. Um, the outbreak was identified uh, on small non-industrial farms, so sort of feeder pigs, pig roast pigs, that kind of uh, scale, but some of these farms have 100, 150 pigs on them. Um, the first batch of pigs was tested, and anybody can should chime in and correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like um, Todd Johnson or or uh, Dave Smith or somebody else should be actually giving this whole talk because I wasn't keeping track of all the individual animals that we dealt with. They were doing that was that was not my my part of the job. Um, it was others, and you'll see how that worked through the slides yeah, that I Jean, show you. Gene, th this is Todd. I am on the call, so um, yeah, the, the actual. I can I can tell you that the actual outbreak really began uh, way back in June with our index herd, and um, it was those that first herd was actually disposed of uh, through rendering, um, and then there were other herds where we disposed of the reactor through the alkaline digester at Cornell. Right. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Great. Great, and feel free to chime in, Todd, as as you wish. Um, I, I think I'll cover all that stuff, but but yeah. Um, so so the so some of the testing was done at Cornell. I didn't know anything about it at the time. Um, I just work here. I, I don't work at the vet school, so. Um, we visited uh, the like, the largest affected farm um, first week in August. And we, I think the for, the plans were being formulated behind the scenes. I was contacted that week or the week right before that. And I was in that part of the state. So I, we went out and visited the farm to see, sort of assess things, see if it was possible to compost on that farm, um, see really what we wanted to be doing, <clears throat> develop some kind of a plan. Um, as Todd said, the negative pigs uh, were rendered. And at first they were rendered, and then after a while, and that'll come later in the story, but after a while, then the rendering didn't want even the ones that were negative. So they had to find different plans for those as well. The estimated pigs were 150, 170 pigs. I don't know what it we ended up doing all together. I'm getting an echo. I don't know if that can be stopped. Okay. 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> So 150 to 170 pigs, and one of the reasons for not knowing exact numbers right up front is that um, we were adding, and some pigs that they thought could be rendered weren't able to be rendered after a while. Um, the pigs ranged from, you know, babies, young babies, four pounds, three pounds, to 600 plus pounds. Um, Oh, sorry. The negative rate pigs were able to be rendered at first. After that, there was a problem. So we were looking, they were looking at what were our disposal op disposal options. Um, checked with landfills, and we've done this several times. Um, checked with landfills and haven't been able to move diseased animals to the landfill. Um, even though everybody feels it would be safe to do that, that hasn't been and the landfills haven't allowed that kind of stuff. The landfills have been in New York have been interactive with with this and actually they supplied the wood chips for this for free. Um, we needed to ship them about 120 miles, but at least we were able to get those wood chips from there and they had very good wood chips that we were able to use. That was a little bit dicey because I didn't get the job of, of finding wood chips until about three days before we started composting. Um, so we didn't have things set up well as far as that went. So we were a little bit a little bit short on, on, on wood chips. But I'll show you how we compensated for that in the slides. Um, do we compost on the farm? The farm was very swampy. Um, and at first we thought, well, maybe I went out with the state vets and um, we thought, well, maybe we could pull it off, but we didn't feel like the, that the farmer would have been able to have the person power, the equipment, um, or be able to do any of the follow through with in this situation. So, and they had the lion's share of the pigs that needed to be composted. Do we euthanize and compost at another location? Um, that was thought about and for a couple weeks actually, is do what are we gonna do? And we do in that area, the state, it's the northeast part of the state. Um, in that part of the state, we did have a composter that actually composted one of the first cows, a farmer that composted one of the first cows um, in New York. So he has a lot of experience. His son has a lot of experience. His grandchildren now have a lot of experience because they were running some of that. Yeah, so had a lot of faith in him. He runs a very clean operation and he runs a compost, a regular compost operation for manure. So he has a lot of experience. So, you know, it was floated, well, how about there? And I'm not gonna mention names just because we don't really want, need that, need that out there. Um, did we have access to carbon? Um, there was quite a bit of carbon in that part of the state. Um, there was quite a bit of expense to that. And we were, uh, this, <clears throat> When we were trying to compost, we were composting right around fair time. And that caused a couple of problems for us, especially because the fair in that county, in that community, is a very large one, well known, and very near where we were going to be doing the work. So um, it was decided that we would go ahead and do it before fair started. Um, one of the problems with that was we had a real hard time getting the trucks because the trucks were taking pigs to fair or animals, livestock to fair. So getting the trucks was harder. So we had to sort of work around some of that stuff, um, which we wouldn't expect. The vets did decide to move them and to the, not the compost facility that the farmer works with, but the, um, a, um, holding area, an extra area that's quite sandy, um, over way away from the farm, away from livestock, 
and away from bedding feed and all that kind of stuff, or uh, new bedding feed and all that kind of stuff. It was a place where they actually um, staged some of their uh, bedding from beef cows. So the the pens were set up ahead of time, the beds were set up ahead of time, but the pigs had to be moved in in these panel trucks. Um, the fences actually held very well as we expected them to. There was some wiring there. There was all kinds of you know protective things, and there was an area, those red panels are the squeeze panels where you're pushing the animal into a smaller area. And the vets, the the um, people that were, the team that was euthanizing was, did an amazing job. Um, I didn't mention that it was about 95 degrees out when we were doing all this. So pretty difficult with um, all the PPE, had to make sure that everybody was okay and, and um, prepared and getting enough water and everything and all that was brought out to the site um the site also had a great as you can see um a great screen around the whole thing so it was hidden from everybody you really had to walk back in there to be able to know that anything was happening oh sorry about that. i think i just moved it um anyway we only had one pig get out of the enclosure the whole time um and we were able to it went over toward the i'll use the arrow i think i you can see this but over towards these piles over here which weren't the mortality piles that was a, a an old compost pile that had been, just been set up by the farmer's grandchildren because they wanted to try composting so that was kind of fun um, but he got out, the pig got out over here. We were able to, we had a lot of people out there, so we were able to corral people. And we had people from all over the country um, doing this. Uh, the person that was used doing the captive bolt, which I don't have any pictures because I was on the other side of the site. And I think I was the only one that took pictures. So um, for the most part, I'll show you when other people's pictures are in here. <clears throat> um, so anyway, get the pigs in, um, and you can see all different breeds, all different types. And this is actually a picture from the second time um, that we went out. And we actually had to we had to compost two different, actually three different days, but two different time periods, and so or killing compost. So we we I'll I'll talk about those dates as we get there. Um, it was August and September. Because it was a disease outbreak, we were taking tissue samples. Um, you can see the animals were killed, captive bolt, scrambled, and then brought over to the brought over to the piles. We laid them on the piles so the blood would be absorbed by the pile. Um, and they took tissue samples of all different types, lymph nodes, brain. I'm going to forget all the things that they were taking, but the animals, as you'll be able to see in some of the pictures, were really cut open in, in many different areas, um, intestines, stuff like that. The way that uh, brucellosis suae is spread is, is body fluids, so semen, um, saliva, blood. Uh, so we were trying to be pretty careful with that. <clears throat> I'll back up just to say that um, here we were very much control controlled the blood that was being um, that was coming out of the animals, but there was blood over in the killing area as well. And at the end of the day, we realized, boy, that's what's going to be bringing wild animals into the site. Um, so the farmer scraped all of that blood up and put a whole lot more carbon down on top of the blood, so that and scooped that up so that we really moved that blood um, out of the soil column there because it really would have attracted animals because it wasn't, it was just laying there. So that was one thing that we sort of looked at afterwards. Even though there was plenty of bedding in the pens, 
it wasn't right where uh, the animals were laying down after they were killed. The animals were brought over to the pile. So I said the, the carbon piles were built ahead of time and we had a lot of good wood chip for the bases. But because um, we didn't have, for the first day anyway, we were doing 100 pigs, something like that, 120. I think in the first two days we did 120 pigs. So we didn't end up having enough carbon there at that point because we were trying to ration the carbon that we needed but you can see piles in the background and they were bedded straw so there was manure and straw and other materials that were generated on the farm and so we used a lot of that material as well in the layers and as cover material as you'll see the um the bases were all pretty heavy, chunky carbon, as we'd like them to be. Um, one pig, so as this whole um, outbreak was, was occurring, um, one of the pigs, one of the boars was moved to Maine um, for breeding purposes. So we ended up, I, I heard pretty quickly, after we got started in New York, that Maine also had to compost a pig. So they killed and composted this pig up here. Mark King, Mark Hutchinson, Bill Seekins, I think, were working um, on that particular pig uh, to, to compost it. But same thing, build that carbonaceous bed, um, lay it down <clears throat> on the bed, and then um, cover, layer it in. This is the, I'm back to the other site. Um, so we're layering at this site. But what they did in the main one um, was they put some some stakes up so that they could see where the animal's legs were laying, where the outer parts of that body were, so they could make sure that the carbon would be covering that animal um, with a good 24 inches of cover over all the parts of the animal because if you just have a leg sticking out or a head sticking out you're still going to be attracting animals to those piles. <clears throat> this is the the September 7th um, layout. The first pile was built. That's the one we can see over to the left with the straw on it. First one was built and had, had been two weeks in the processing already uh, by the time we added this further bed. So we had the first windrow here on the left and then that partial windrow there, you can actually see a temperature probe part way up there. Um, that was processing material that was two weeks into processing or, or so. Uh, we're layering those in. We had more carbon the second time we were able to get another load Another, another big load of carbon, and we had a lot less pigs the second time that we had to compost. So most of those were in carbon. One thing that um, one remark that that Todd made when we went and dug into the piles was, I think that's that second pile worked a little better, and we did have a lot more wood chip in there and a lot more carbon in there. But you'll see from the temperatures that we had good temperatures in both of the piles. Um, you can see some of the settling. We did have a little bit of chimneying. We didn't have any any animals digging into the piles at all, but we did have some chimneying. And what I mean by chimneying is you have a big animal. You could have a five, 600 pound uh, animal down on the bottom and it sort of uh, blows or, you know, creates a chimney and some of that chimney is coming down. And the way you can find some of those is the flies start coming and looking at those. So we just would cover those up um, the second day. We covered those up so that we wouldn't have any problems with it because those are things that are almost unavoidable and you just need to be going back to check to make sure that there's no problem. Um, as you can see in the right hand picture um, down at the end, there's a second layer of pigs going on down, down there. Um, good cover over the piles and honestly we had endless amounts of the bedding so we really laid it on there. 
um, and we walked the piles. We made sure that everything was good. We poked the piles, make sure that we had good coverage, um, and worked with that. At the most of the or quite a few of the pigs were larger pigs that had to be euthanized um, with captive bolt. But this the black truck there brought in 50 um, piglets, and those were just in a Gaylord box. They had been euthanized on farm, and I think with pentobarbital, and those animals are all in the far end of that pile. And we really had to stage things a lot because we get different size animals at different points, and I was really trying to make sure that we had a good density of animals through the piles and that the babies or the younger pigs would be placed between the larger pigs' uh, legs. Uh, one of the things we learned with composting cows versus composting something the size of a deer is you need to balance that mass. And so we, these animals are small enough that we can have them leg to leg or back to back so that we have that carbon to nitrogen ratio work out properly. Um, what happens in that pile, this is just a graphic from other things that we use is is the air is pulled in from the bottom of the pile. The, well, first of all, the pile heats up. The air, air is pulled in from the bottom of the pile because the hot air is rising and the hot air is taking out other air, CO2 and oxygen as well. So the, the, if we build those piles properly, they will naturally aerate themselves and that's a passively aerated or a static air, pile aeration. Um, pretty simple, but it's if we use this concept, we can make this work and we can control the temperatures uh, and really know what's going on in that inside that pile uh, very well. As you can see, sorry, this is a little bit blurry to my eyes anyway. Um, we had 140 degrees by the second day. Um, we were in pretty good shape and the straw was working well. The extra manure that was in the bedded straw uh, helps a little bit as well. <laughs> okay. Um, so in the outbreak, let me just walk you through this. Uh, the top line is days, day one, day two, day three, day six, and then I went to every two days. Um, and I was averaging temperatures in 18 and 36. And these temperatures were taken between the vets a little bit, um, but the farmer and myself at different points. Now, I live four hours away from this site, so it wasn't me that was going back and forth constantly. So uh, other people were taking temperatures as we needed to check on things. We did check on things. So on the 18th and 19th, so August 18th and 19th, you know, we started out, as I said, it was at like a 95 degree day anyway. Um, and we started out 95, 98. Next day, you know, we we're climbing right up there. and. And by day three, we we have really good temperatures in those piles. Um, and then all the way out. And um, I'm going to move you, Becky. <laughs> There's a, you're on my screen. Um, so we had good for the first two weeks. And these are started at different times. That's why I have them separate. And they're in uh, the Windrows 1 and Windrow 2. They're in separate um, separate columns, rows and columns. Um, then after the two weeks, then we were periodically going out and just checking temperatures. Um, so we went, you know, some temperatures were going down a little bit, but in still in good range, um, uh, and still pretty, pretty good through, um, end of September, early October on both of the piles. You'll see the pile, the temperatures were a little bit higher on windrow two, um, and that's why I
we dug into the pile at on 12.7. And um, this is, I'm getting a bunch of static. Um, Jean? Yeah? This is Lori. Back on the uh -huh. previous slide, on day yeah. eight for Windrow One, I noticed a dip in the temperature. Was that just a temperature anomaly, or was did it really drop for some reason? And if so, why? Um, Windrow you know, it's hard to tell. We may have had a rain that day. Um, it was at 36 inches. Something may have. Sometimes the carcasses break apart at different points, so you're getting more air or less air. Uh, in different parts of the pile. Thank you. Um, so we dug into the pile at, at um, the 7th of December. There was definitely snow on the piles. I'll show you a shot of that. Um, Dr. Johnson sent an email with these pictures after we had dug into the piles. Even before I got home, he was fast. Um, and the temperatures were still in 130s, 140s um, in spots, uh, mostly bones and hide remain, very little discernible, discernible soft tissue. We checked inside the brain case, and generally the brain, I think, is probably the most delectable for the microorganisms and nice and soft and digestible, and it goes very fast in most of these, um, most of the mortality. Uh, and you can see about a 131, 132 on that temperature probe right there. That was that day with the snow around it. Um, these are the piles. Uh, pile one, windrow one is to the left, right is windrow two. And, you know, they sunk quite a lot. And there was really very, very little tissue in any of those. Um, disposal of the end product, uh, the farmer plans to, um, <laughs> unless there's another outbreak, we won't use, reuse it as a base, and I'm not sure if we would decide to do that or not, but carbon is hard to get, so we might. Um, the, the material will be, some of the large bones will be removed and the material will be land spread eventually, but we're, at this point we were at four months when we opened that pile and we still had a little bit of, you know, hide, hair, teeth, certainly we've got bones. We're going to have bones for a while longer, except where the baby pigs were. That was nothing uh, because those bones just haven't calcified. So there was just, just uh, look like compost. Um, and so, so the farmer will be using it on non-human, uh, consumption food crops is the plan. But I don't know when that will happen. I'd say it's probably gonna happen uh, like next fall or something like that. I don't think they're in any hurry to move the animals out of there, um, to move the piles out of there because it's a place where they can store things kind of. So, and that's where we are, so. You can see these these pigs were on. This is a second layer of pigs, and they are on on a straw base there. I'll let it, open it up to any questions that anybody has. Um, Lori Miller, for a, a very interesting presentation. Uh, one, so it looks like. This was the layering method as opposed to the mixing that we for uh, commonly influenza. Um, is it true that, and do you think that if there was no turning, would that have affected the overall or, um, you know, pathogen inactivation throughout? Laura, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. Layered, not mixed, right? I've got, I think I have the gist. 
these pigs were, you know, six, 700 pounds. It would have been very difficult to do any mixing with these guys. We could have done it with the babies, but we had no need to do that. So um, we simply layered them in. One of my rules is if you can lift it, you can layer it. And some of that's done because we want that carbon and nitrogen ratio to be proper. And we need that. So, so we're going to have a, a good layer of material in between each of these pig layers. And we did just go two pig layers in these because we had some sizable pigs. I, Todd probably could tell us what the biggest pig was. But I know that there were some really big pigs. One day, the second day, <laughs> the loader wasn't going, wasn't there at, you know, for a minute. And so we started dragging some pigs across the, <clears throat> across the way. And boy, that was, we only got to about four or five pigs and then we stopped because it was just, it was hard labor. <clears throat> so I don't think there's a way that you could easily mix the pigs unless you just had babies. And Jean, um, wasn't the other issue because the mat the material was carried in fluid, mixing might spread it around? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But mixing, I think we're talking, I think that was Mark King's voice. Um, yes. When we were mixing, when we were mixing AI carcasses, we would mix them and we mix and layer in the AI and it were, both of them work quite well. Um, it just really depends on what you need to be doing. But once you mix those, then that uh, Twinkie center, so to speak, has to be on carbon and then totally covered with carbon. So, that, that's, um, yeah. Okay, well, I, I guess uh, our veterinarian did not want us to do any mixing down the road either, partly because she was okay. concerned yeah. at, at what point the testes would actually have gotten composted enough that the fluid inside would be disabled. And so the thought was that if you turn after 14 or 28, there still might be, you know, viable fluid that you're dispersing. And that was the concern we had. Right. Great point, Mark. It, it's, yeah, we wouldn't, if you're mixing like two or three weeks in the, into the process, then you're going to have to envelop the, envelop everything again, in another carbon source, because you're going to have flesh and stuff like that on the outside. So with stuff like this, we really don't, with, with deer, we, we do <clears throat> after six months we'll restack so we call it kind of restacking and then it goes into a larger pile so that there's more space basically but with pigs like this this there was a lot of flesh there it's a lot of dense flesh a lot of heavy bone and so mixing is not something that we would have considered doing and i don't think the farmer would have i don't think he had equipment that could have done it Honestly, he had big pieces of equipment, but that's hard work, hard on the equipment. Um, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, you're breaking up a little bit, but go ahead, give it a try. So, um, and, and I understand that the layering is the better approach. So, uh, get information about was, when we mixed for a idea was, you know, after two weeks, all of the outer envelope would be turned to be processed. Mm -hmm. And so if we're just late, that does not get processed the same way a portions do. And when with the cold temperatures, do you think there was less pathogen? Did somebody get enough of that question? I I didn't. You really are breaking up quite a bit. Um, I'll send it in a chat. That'd be great. And then Brian could read it or somebody could read it. Yeah. Or let me see. See where the chats are. Oh, 
while Lori is um, typing out her chat, um, I was going to remind everybody uh, one thing that I forgot to mention. If you are using your phone for audio, um, I have muted everybody because we were receiving some feedback. So on your phone, if you hit star four, it will unmute you so that you can ask a question. Hi, this is Dora Solander. Can anyone, can I be heard? Hi, Doris. We can hear you, Doris. Hi. I put a chat up, but I have no idea if it got put up. Uh, a key in this is to use caution when composting euthanized animals. Uh, if you kill bald or golden eagles, it's a federal crime. And I, we were at one depopulation site where the minute the deer were euthanized, bald eagles were in the trees. So we had to get people, up because we weren't disposing the same day, we had to get people up and out there at 5.30 in the morning to make sure they didn't come down and feed. So that's really, really important not to let these birds get near it. Uh, absolutely, and it ends up being the vet's problem if they've, you know, legal issue if they've killed birds of prey. So it, it yeah. is something that we have to take very and seriously. I, we all do. Right. And I put up a link on secondary poisonings from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Did my chat show up? I don't know where the chat Your, is. Yours did not. Yeah, there it yours. is. Oh, there it is. I um, just, yeah. So I just put up a link to Fish and Wildlife Service. Brian, should I stop sharing? Uh, if you want to. Yes, did. Because then I think I can see chats and stuff. Otherwise, I'm not. So, Gene, this is Mark King. Um, Lori's basic question was whether or not the pile, because the animals were layered, observed or had periods of anaerobic activity. And um, what I tried to say, but I was muted, is that in Maine, like when we do cows and stuff, we leave them there for eight to 12 weeks and they do have periods of anaerobic activity, but that's what happens in a normal pile as well. And we still see great degradation. Yeah, absolutely. We do have, we will have anaerobicity and aerobicity in all of those piles. If you think about it, the animal is a big bag and the skin is holding everything in. And that, unless that uh, bag is, is opened, nothing really comes out of it. So that's all anaerobic. Our stomachs are anaerobic. There, you know, there's some oxygen in there sometimes, but you know, it goes quickly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so uh, we are always gonna have aerobicity and anaerobicity in all piles. What happens is as things liquefy, as the animals liquefy, the, the chunky bases and the carbon underneath is absorbing all that material, all that liquid. Uh, we've collected all the liquid from underneath piles that were well built. And we got, I think, Mary's not on, I know, but I think we got two quarts of liquid that actually came out of the, those piles. And we were using like a, a meat cutting board, so to speak, a large one, but to, to collect all of that leachate. So we were getting all of it and we just didn't have much coming out of the pile so when they are made well we don't have that problem that all mixes together that all heats up especially if we have good carbon good uh, chunky carbon on the base and we have um we've assured that we have good destruction of everything so we've done a lot of the research on that and it it's uh we we really have looked for everything <laughs> Yeah, this, this is Todd. Um, can can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, as far as from a pathogen reduction standpoint, I think one of the things that made us feel pretty good was we were getting pretty good temperatures out of these piles for it was roughly three to three and a half months um, that we were maintaining some of these temperatures um, to the point that we dug into the pile. So we were feeling pretty good that we were getting effective heating and good pathogen reduction for that period of time with those temperatures. In addition to that, when we dug into the pile, 
three to three and a half months later, there were very little soft tissues left of the kinds of tissues that are you know going to be carrying that organism. So the virtual disappearance of those soft tissues. Um, I think also was a pretty good indication that at least as far as the pathogens were concerned, they were pretty well eliminated. Plus, we also had the reassurance that we knew these piles were going to sit there for, you know, well into at least next spring. So um, there wasn't going to be anything done with them for, for quite some time. One thing that we did with the... Uh, um with the roadkill research that we had done, we had we looked for all kinds of stuff in that those piles. And one of the things we did find with certain organisms was that they did they did make it to six months. They were reduced, they were reduced, they were reduced, but some organisms not not like brucellosis is much weaker than a lot of the organisms that I'm talking about, like yonis and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but the we'd have good reduction by nine months we were we were terrific so we liked with the larger animals we like to keep them in piles for longer just because it's just a good assurance that everything's been taken care of we also have seen that much earlier than that we're killing everything and like with the avian influenza that's killed very quickly with the brucellosis, we think that it's killed very quickly just because we have a whole chart on comparisons of organisms and how tough they are, um, how easily they are killed, and how they can regrow if given the right conditions. So we have a chart that kind of looks at all of that also. Um, so I think we're, we're pretty confident that that's taken care of. So somebody was asking about um, biosecurity. And uh, Todd, if you want to answer that one, you can, or I can, whatever. Okay, yeah, and maybe just a little more context about the extent of the outbreak that we had in New York. We had six total reactor herds that we end up having to depopulate in one way or the other. In some cases, we used on-site burial. Uh, the index herd, the first herd that was infected, went to a renderer. Um, there were certain reactor animals that ended up going through the alkaline digester at Cornell. Um, but there were three herds actually that ended up having pigs uh, disposed of at this site. And this site turned out to be a, uh, an ideal situation for us because we did not look forward to the prospect of having to euthanize these pigs um, on some of these farms. It just was logistically, it was just not a good situation. And so this is a very remote site, really kind of ideal conditions to truck these animals to this site. There was a reasonable distance from each of these herds. And I'm sorry, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but I think it was a total of about 250 pigs of various sizes from the three farms that we ended up um, euthanizing and, and disposing on this site. So um, it really was in many ways a very ideal situation for us. As far as the biosecurity, <clears throat> this, this site was actually in a, a sand pit of sorts and it had high, almost like a ravine. So it's very well enclosed. And so there was kind of like an obvious entrance point and an exit point, and we kind of set up um, a, a clean, dirty line of sorts. Um, although not being as highly contagious a disease with brucellosis as we have with avian influenza or something like foot and mouth disease, um, it, it doesn't have the same type of contagiousness as those viruses do. But we had an entrance point at which you know everybody donned their PPE. Um, and could kind of uh, cross in and out. Um, and uh, so the, the biosecurity from a logistical standpoint was, was kind of a uh, pretty straightforward setup. And we did, we did do, um, we had a power sprayer out there. We had a couple of tanks of water loaded on the back end of a pickup truck uh, with a generator 
in well actually no we didn't have a generator it, it had a gas powered engine on the power sprayer so we ended up dis cleaning and disinfecting all of the fencing panels all of the heavy equipment the loaders um and uh, we were using vercon as the disinfectant and uh, the tra the trailer that was used to transport the pigs we backed that up to the end of the compost pile that was uh, cleaned and disinfected onto the end of the compost pile um, as it unloaded each load of pigs and left the site. So that worked out pretty well. Any other questions about the biosecurity? There's one in here about um, the bonnets and the respirator straps. So it's industrial hygienists recommend placing the bonnets or hoods over the respirator straps. Um, everybody had their own PPE, so there was a lot of different, a lot of different things. And I think Todd, you can comment, but I think the some of the face shields were working better. Um, yeah. Than the respirators. Yeah. yeah. Right. That we we were wearing N95 respirators, um, and of course, in the 95 degree heat, that was tough. Um, and what seemed to work best in terms of face and eye protection was these um, were these uh, face shields. Um, really seemed to work well because the air could circulate on under them. Um, it was much cooler. Um, and when you're sweating and it's hot, um, plus they gave you that that good face protection because when you're euthanizing pigs, um, it you know you've got objects sometimes flying and you know there's a lot of physical type things going on. So uh, the face shields work really really well as opposed to something like goggles. Um, there are a couple of other ones on it on PPE. It says um, in the in the the shots, the photos. It looked like disposable boots were not used. Uh, many people were using disposable boots. Some people were using um, their boots and disinfecting, and everything was taped um, regardless. The the clothing or the the pants were taped to taped. The sleeves were taped. Yeah, so. it, and the, the the rubber boots were preferable in many ways. Like I said, it, it's a lot of physical what uh, labor. Uh, I don't know that disposable boots are really going to hold up very well when you're herding pigs and um, with that amount of movement going on. Uh, rubber boots just hold up a whole lot better. And we had lots of different disinfectants. There were several. There was work on, but there were other ones that other vets had brought some of their own stuff. So there was a couple of different, and I think people actually disinfected a couple of times with different things. Um, somebody was asking about uh, cleaning, disinfecting the trailer. When the trailer came in, it was, and I wasn't over there, but it was. It was disinfected, cleaned, and it was, you know, brushed out and disinfected on the site before it left to go to the next site. Uh, Todd, go ahead and add anything. Yeah, that's correct. And we had C and D setups on some of the farms too, and so um, we could also clean and disinfect that um, truck on the farm site as well. So I think there was at least one occasion, for whatever reason it was, that we didn't get the truck disinfected um, at the compost site. We sent the truck back to the farm um, to get cleaned and disinfected there because we had a setup there to do it. I'm going to jump back to some of the other um, questions. Uh, if there was a larger 
if if outbreak was larger, would there be sufficient resources, carbon resources available? We're not short of carbon in New York State. I can find it. If we need it, I can find what we need. Um, and we could have gotten a lot from the landfill if we wanted. We could have paid more for other sources of it that were closer. Um, there really wasn't a shortage. It was the timing that was the problem the first time. And that's why we didn't have more wood chips. We should have had two truckloads of wood chips. All that the, the truckers could only send us one load, one convey one load by that time. It was just because it was a little bit last minute. Um, there was another one in there. Does anybody see the other one that didn't get answered? Oh, is this chart publicly available? Which chart you can, the PowerPoint is publicly available. If anybody needs portions of the PowerPoint or would like to use portions of the PowerPoint, as far as I'm concerned, our stuff is public domain. I think we're picking up somebody else. Put in as well. And I just want somebody to, if they have time to remote in today, to installed. Brian, are you there? I'm here. Okay. I think we're picking up another conversation. And I think, unless, does anybody else have more questions, I guess? I guess one of the, the question about the chart was was the chart for destruction of pathogens. Is that chart available publicly uh, on your website? It is available, absolutely. Um, and you can read through the whole thing. I will send the URL. Or can you have a URL for that? I don't. I can get it. She's no, just I'm going to have my secretary find the URL and we'll send it out to everybody. Okay. Or, or I may be able to, let me just well, see. I don't know what, what, what Hold on. Okay. I'm working on it, Arlene. Oh, shoot. Am I out of here? Did I get cut off? I think I fell out of blue jeans. No, there we are. Okay. Um, let me pull it up. If you can hear me, let me just pull that up and we'll go from there. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I'll. You can go ahead with the other discussions, and I'll pull up that stu those studies, and and you can read through those. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for um for your presentation. It was really interesting to see the differences and and um pretty uh, difficult situation there, but appreciate appreciate it. And and it's recorded, so um so Brian will have the the link to the recording. And um, so people can go back and, and re look at the recording later. So you bet, Arlene. Um, anytime. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So and I so I guess Lori can go ahead and do the the roll call and.